Welcome to Role Playing History, the podcast where we explore the history of role playing games. I'm Wayne Davis, and I'll be your guide for today's tour. Episode 16 White Wolf Publishing and Pinnacle Entertainment Group. After doing a deep dive into a favorite game of mine last week, this week we're going to take a look at not only the company that created that game, but also a company that created another of the best selling series of games in role playing history. Let's start with that second one first, and you'll figure out which game I'm talking about as we go along. To discuss the history of White Wolf Publishing, we have to go back a bit further and discuss a company known as Lion Rampant. Lion Rampant Publishing was established in 1987 by Jonathan Tweet and Mark Ryan Hagen. They're both game creators, and they established Lion Rampant to provide themselves with a platform to publish their creations. Shortly after the company was established, Lisa Stevens joined the company to act as the editor for their projects. The role-playing game Lion Rampant is best known for is Ars Magica. Now, we discussed Ars Magica briefly during the game timeline for the late 1980s, and I intend to cover it in a long form in another episode, but here's a brief overview of the game. Ars Magica was released in 1987. It's set in Mythic Europe, which is a historically grounded version of Europe and the Levant around 1200 AD. It has the added point that the prevalent folklore and institutions of the High Middle Ages are factual reality. The involvement of the players in the game revolves around an organization of magi and their allies and foes, both mundane and supernatural. Ars Magica was one of the first examples of a troop system, which we'll see more of later in this episode, and this first edition recommended that players collaborate to create the world, with each player having the opportunity to be a story guide, which is the term for the GM in this game. This would be accomplished by switching off between play sessions, also known as chapters. Furthermore, it was encouraged for each player to have more than one character. This allowed for players to switch characters as the game necessitated. One more note on this short recap of Ars Magica. To keep the authenticity of the game setting, the game uses medieval Latin for a number of the key terms. So, for all of you medieval Latin scholars who wondered when in the hell you'd actually use that in the real world, here you are. Lion Rampant published another product of note. In 1987, prior to the release of Ars Magica, the company published Whimsy Cards. This card set, which was described by many as, quote, 48 flimsy cards and a four-page rules pamphlet, end quote, was designed to provide players with another method to help direct the story of the game. 43 of the cards had distinct story elements printed on them, with five blanks included for players or the story guide to write in their own ideas. At the beginning of a session, the cards were to be shuffled and dealt out to the players. During the session itself, if the player had a card they wanted to play, they could. After describing how it would apply to the current story, if the story guide agreed to it, it would be incorporated into the story. Otherwise, the story guide had the right to veto it. Whimsy cards were, needless to say, not an overwhelming success, but they did provide a bit of capital for Lion Rampant to complete their initial publication of Ars Magica, so in that vein, it was successful. Lion Rampant continued as a company until 1990, when they joined forces with another group. That group was White Wolf Magazine. White Wolf Magazine was created in 1986 by Stuart and Steve Week, who decided as high schoolers to self-publish their own gaming magazine. Steve Week gets credit for choosing the name White Wolf, claiming Elric of Melnabone as inspiration. White Wolf Magazine was published by the company they formed, White Wolf Publishing, in August of 1986. So, we've seen Lion Rampant, and we've gotten a brief introduction to White Wolf Magazine, in 1990, the two joined forces, using the name of the magazine's publishing company as the overall name for their new company, White Wolf Publishing. Now, going back to the magazine for a minute, it was reported in an editorial in White Wolf Magazine at the time that the magazine would continue to be independent of the game design portion of the company, and the magazine would continue to be published, with its name being changed to White Wolf Infobia with issue 50 in 1995. However, the magazine wouldn't last, and issue 57 would be its last before it was discontinued. 
For the record, White Wolf Magazine won Origins Awards for Best Professional Adventure Gaming Magazine in both 1991 and 1992. White Wolf's big claim to fame are the role-playing games released in what they named the World of Darkness. The original World of Darkness ran from 1991 to 2002 and consisted of Vampire the Masquerade, Werewolf the Apocalypse, Mage the Ascension, Wraith the Oblivion, Changeling the Dreaming, Hunter the Reckoning, and Demon the Fallen. There were also offshoots of some of these games published as part of the line, with games such as the Asia-themed Kindred of the East and the historical vampire game, Vampire the Dark Ages. So, let's do a bit of background on these games, shall we? I mean, after all, what kind of history podcaster would I be if I passed up this opportunity? Besides, you might find something you might want to play, but just didn't know about. You're welcome. Vampire the Masquerade was designed by Mark Ryan Hagen, Graham Davis, Tom Dowd, Lisa Stevens, and Stuart Week, and the first edition was released in 1991. Vampire has a gothic punk feel to it, and the players take the roles of vampires, thus the name of the game. In this game, rather than call themselves vampires, they are referred to as kindred. The game itself covers their night-to-night -night struggles with themselves, vampire hunters, other groups, and whatever else a game creator can come up with. Vampire utilizes the storytelling system, which we'll get into in detail in another show. For our purposes today, the storytelling system utilizes a dot system for character attributes or skills. Dots are purchased with character points, and each dot equals a 10-sided die. So, when making attribute or skill checks for each dot in one of those, you get to roll a 10-sided die. The storyteller, the GM in the system, gives you a target number to roll, and for each die with that number on it, you get a success. If you get the number of successes needed, you succeed at the task. Any die with a 1 on it is a failure, and each failure takes away a success. Anyway, that's the system in a simplified version. Like I said, we're going to dig deeper into that in another show. Getting back into Vampire, humanity is the central theme of the game, and vampires even have a humanity score. As that score decreases, the vampire's beast, or feral side, takes over. Should it ever take completely over, the vampire goes into a frenzy, and at that point the character should be taken over by the storyteller, as the player really no longer has control. Now, we'll be deep diving Vampire in a future episode, so while you got a bit of background here, this isn't the whole story. Hey, if I gave it all out now, what would I have for another show? Come on, cut me a little slack. Werewolf the Apocalypse was designed by Mark Ryan Hagen, and the first edition was released in 1992. While the rules basics are the same as Vampire, the big obvious difference between the games is that in Werewolf, the characters are the Garou, which comes from the French term loup garou. Basically, this means the characters are were creatures. I say were creatures because players aren't limited to just playing werewolves. In fact, in the game I'm playing in currently, we have werewolves, were bears, were owls, were ravens, were panthers. <laughs> you get the point. So much like the fact that there are different flavors of vampires, there are different styles of were creatures, and the game covers the interactions of the various were clans with each other, as well as the encroachment of urban sprawl on their territory. Werewolf shares the same gothic punk style as Vampire, and of most of the other games in this line. Mage the Ascension was designed by Stuart Week, Christopher Early, Stephen Week, Bill Bridges, Sam Chupp, and Andrew Greenberg, and was released in 1993. Now, one of the things that makes Mage different from the previous two games we've discussed is that it was fairly heavily influenced by Ars Magica. That becomes more obvious when you realize that mages, who are the characters in the game, have the ability to shape reality through magic. The game calls the process of a mage discovering their ability to use magic as the Awakening, which can be a very traumatic experience for that character. The adventures themselves focus on the mages discovering their abilities, then interacting with the various factions involved in the game, some of which are magical, others are more technology-based, and others are just flat-out anti-mage. The game doesn't tie in vampires or werewolves either, which also makes it different from the first two titles, as those would at the very least refer to the other, if not provide the opportunity for conflict. 
Wraith the Oblivion was designed by Mark Reinhagen, Sam Chupp, and Jennifer Harshorn, and the first edition was released in 1994. The focus of Wraith was way different than the previous three entries in the World of Darkness, as the players are playing characters who have died and are trying to navigate the afterlife. Characters can either choose a true afterlife, known as Transcendence, get involved in the politics and machinations of the Denzians of the afterlife, or succumb gradually into the oblivion that wants to devour newly deceased souls. Wraith also leaves the gothic punk vibe of the previous games in the line and goes straight for the horror setting, as you no doubt figured out from my brief description. For the record, it should be noted that Wraith was the least successful and least popular of all the line of World of Darkness. Changeling the Dreaming was created by Mark Reinhagen, Sam Chupp, Ian Lemke, and Joshua Gabriel Tenbrook, and was released in July of 1995. Continuing the gothic punk vibe of most of the previous games in the series, players in Changeling are playing members of the Fae, or Fairy World. Now, this also means the game draws on mythologies from a number of other different cultures, including Native American, Greek, Indian, and Yoruban mythology. I would also note that if you've read the books in the Dresden Files, you got a pretty good idea about how the Fae operate in this game. Reviews for Changeling were bland, but this game was huge for France for a period of time in the late 1990s. Hunter the Reckoning was a different style of game in the World of Darkness, created by Mark Ryan Hagen, Andrew Bates, Phil Bricado, Ken Cliffe, Greg Fountain, Ed Hall, Jess Heinig, Michael Lee, Richard Thomas, Mike Tinney, and Stuart Week. It was released in 1999. Now, when I say different, I mean different. Hunters are presumed to be new to the world. They are, as you might guess, hunting the things that go bump in the night. However, there's not a lot of information given in the game about them. That's different from Vampire and Werewolf, where there's a lot of information for characters to learn about their opponents. Instead, the mystery of the what is part of what fuels the gameplay. Also, groups in this game are very disjointed and disorganized, feeding on that newness of hunters in the game world. White Wolf produced a ton of product to support Hunter, and it's still played by a number of folks around the world. Demon the Fallen was created by Michael B. Lee, Steve Kenzin, Lucian Solban, Greg Stolze, Adam Tenworth, and Pauline Benny, and was released in 2002. The basics of this game are that the players are playing demons. You know, literal fallen angels who have descended into hell after the long war with heaven. The idea of the game is for the players to restore the grace of the fallen and try to reconnect with humanity while evading monstrous demons and staving off their own agony. Sounds like a roaring good time for the whole family to me. I'm just kidding. While I haven't played the game myself, I have spoken with a number of folks who have, and while they've reported the game can get intense at times, they really had a good time playing the game. At the time, Demon was well supported by White Wolf, but it only got the one printing. Now, as I mentioned above, Kindred of the East and Vampire of the Dark Ages were offshoots of Vampire, so their game styles are similar, though their settings are different. The World of Darkness was supported, for the most part, until 2004, when the series was rebooted and renamed Chronicles of Darkness. There were 11 titles in that line, with Vampire, Werewolf, Mage, Hunter, and Changeling getting new titles, and new games such as Promethean the Created, Beast the Primordial, Mummy the Curse, Demon the Descent, and Deviant the Renegades getting released as well. You know, after doing all this, I think maybe we need to do a deep dive into both the World of Darkness and the Chronicle of Darkness, so we'll scratch that onto the schedule for a future episode. Now, with a huge library of World of Darkness materials being published, one might think that's all White Wolf did. Well, if you thought that, you'd be wrong. And I'll show you what I mean about that right after we take a break. Okay, so before the break, I said I was going to go a little bit deeper into what else White Wolf did. Well, the company also published a high fantasy game, Exalted, along with the game Scion plus a ton of D20 system material under their imprint Sword and Sorcery. On top of all of that, they released a complimentary series to the World of Darkness, which is a LARP system called Mind's Eye Theater. Exalted is a high fantasy game, developed by Robert Hatch, Justin Achille, Stephen Week, Andrew Bates, Dana Habacker, Sherry M. Johnson, Chris McDonough, and Richard Thomas. 
released in 2001. It utilizes the storyteller system developed for Vampire and has the players playing characters who are the chosen champions of greater powers. This means that many of the challenges presented to them during the course of the game would be impossible for normal human beings. However, the character's benefactors have imbued them with charms, which help them accomplish the tasks they're set out to do. Exalted was well received upon its release, and you can still play it today. Scion was designed by John Chambers and a literal cast of dozens, and was released in September of 2007. In Scion, players take on the roles of mortals who are descended from gods. They are tasked with doing the boots-on-the-ground work for their parents in the mortal world. Mythologies from across numerous cultures are utilized in the game, and through the multiple supplements released, characters can come from any number of mythologies. The first edition of this game utilized the storyteller system, but this was changed for subsequent editions. Again, Scion is still available for play today, and those who play it speak highly of it. I could do an entire episode on the Sword and Sorcery imprint, and I probably will, so I'm not going to get into too many details here. However, one thing I do want to mention is that Monty Cook's Arcana Unearthed series was a part of it. If you don't know who Monty Cook is, well, first off, we're going to be doing a deep dive piece on him in a couple of weeks, so you will get to know him. For now, just understand that Monty is one of the big names in D&D game and his work is played by thousands of players on almost a daily basis. So, let's take a quick look now at Mind's Eye Theater. It's a set of rules established to promote live-action role-playing, or LARP. Vampire tends to be the game most commonly LARPed, and it's the game the first rules for Mind's Eye were created for. Later, rules were created for the rest of the games in the World of Darkness line. So what kind of rules do you put into place for a LARP? Well, instead of rolling dice, disputes were to be settled through the rock-paper-scissors method. In addition, players were encouraged to carry a deck of 10 playing cards, ace through 10. If a skill check was called for, the player would draw a card from their deck, add their skill modifier, and compare it to the other checks. Other than that, the rules provide guidance in actually running a LARP session. So if it's something that interests you, pick up a copy of the rules and check it out. Now, getting back to White Wolf. White Wolf also published a few collectible card games, Arcadia, Rage, and Vampire the Eternal Struggle. They also licensed Vampire and Hunter for video game use. However, White Wolf couldn't last on its own forever, and on November 11, 2006, White Wolf Publishing and CCP Games, based out of Iceland, would merge forces. One year later, it was announced that CCP White Wolf was getting out of the tabletop role-playing game business. At that time, Onyx Path Publishing stepped in and purchased as much of the product line rights as they could in order to continue producing the games. And that's where we'll end our White Wolf tour, though we will get into Onyx Path Publishing another time. So with that in mind, let's take a look at our other publisher subject for the week. Pinnacle Entertainment Group. Pinnacle Entertainment Group was created by Shane Lacey Hensley when he wanted to create a 19th century miniature game. That game was called Fields of Honor and was released in 1994. At the time, Hensley didn't have the structure in place to handle distribution and a lot of the other behind the scenes stuff, so he worked with Chameleon Eclectic on the release. One year later, the two companies worked together again, releasing The Last Crusade, which was a collectible card game created by John Hoppler and set in World War II. Pinnacle and Chameleon Eclectic would go their separate ways after The Last Crusade, with Hensley bringing in Greg Gordon and Matt Forbeck to shore up Pinnacle before the release of the game that put Pinnacle on the map in 1996. Now, we just talked about that game last week, Deadlands. In 1999, Pinnacle released another role-playing game, Brave New World. Matt Forbeck was the designer for the game, which is an alternate history superhero game. Brave New World is set in a fascist USA that has been in perpetual state of martial law since the 1960s. Forbeck has reported over the years that he was inspired in the creation of the game by a couple of Batman comic storylines, Kingdom Come and The Dark Knight Returns. 
Brave New World uses a system similar to the one created for Deadlands, with poker cards and poker chips being used. However, the game only uses a six-sided die. Brave New World was sold to Alderac Entertainment Group in 2000 and was ultimately canceled in early 2001. For the record, all of the Brave New World books are available in PDF through drivethroughrpg.com. In 2001, Pinnacle released another major line for the company, calling it Weird Wars. Based at least spiritually on the concepts created for Deadlands, Weird War II, the first game in the line, has the players playing as allied soldiers during the Second World War. The characters encounter haunted vehicles, fight mutant Nazi soldiers, and investigate the supernatural. Magic in the game is fairly low-powered, but technology in the game is a bit higher than in Deadlands. Also, the history of Deadlands does not carry over into this game. It should also be noted that the system utilized for Weird Wars is the D20 system rather than the Deadlands system. Weird Wars was designed by John R. Hoppler and Shane Lacey Hensley and was decently reviewed by the gaming community. Now, sometime between the release of Weird War 2 and 2003, Pinnacle Entertainment Group changed its name to Great White Games. Apparently, the name change was the only major change in the company, as Shane Lacey Hensley was still at the helm, and all of the previous released product that had been supported was still being supported. In 2003, Great White Games released a title that is still being utilized by the company to great success today, Savage Worlds. Savage Worlds was designed to be both a role-playing game and a miniatures game. The system itself is very streamlined, designed to be a basic system that can be used to play games in any genre. Savage Worlds utilizes the tagline, Fast, Furious, Fun, in order to emphasize the streamlined rules and ease of play for the system. Every release in the Savage Worlds line, since the core rules, is intended to be a self-contained campaign, which minimizes the prep time needed for a GM. However, it should also be noted that Deadlands has gotten a release with Savage World rules, and other companies have allowed some of their titles to be released with Savage World rules as well. Rifts and Pathfinder are two that come to mind first when discussing non-Great White Games Pinnacle Entertainment Group games. In 2004, a follow-up to Weird War II was released, titled Tour of Darkness. This game was set during the Vietnam War and was keyed to the Savage World rule set. In late 2005, Hensley announced that Great White Games would be changing its name back to its original name, and thus Pinnacle Entertainment Group was once again the name for the company. In recent years, Pinnacle has focused almost exclusively on the Savage World settings for their games and continue to work with other publishers to try to bring some of their titles to the Savage World setting. They're also preparing to bring a superpowers game to Savage Worlds. They're launching a crowdfunding campaign on their website. Head over to PEGINC.com to check it out if you're interested. And with that, we come to the end of today's tour. Next week, we're going to do another game deep dive. Pathfinder's the game, and while it's similar to D&D on the surface, you're going to find out just how different it is when we take this deeper look. Need to give another shout out to the crew at For The Loot Gaming. Those guys have been promoting the hell out of this podcast during their live streams. So if you're into watching folks live stream video gaming, I strongly encourage you to give them a watch. Again, that's For The Loot Gaming on Twitch. You can also check them out on Twitter, at For The Loot Gaming. Wanted to take another minute to say hello and welcome to our new listeners. I've been peeping the numbers and we're gaining new listeners all over the United States and all around the world. So wherever you're listening to us, I appreciate you. And I only ask that you tell your friends, family, coworkers, <laughs> hell, tell anybody you think might like us about this podcast. Of course, I haven't forgotten about all of you that have been with us since day one-ish. Your loyalty has not been forgotten. My hope is that at some point we've got the ability to start doing giveaways so that I can show you just how much your loyalty means. But I'm broke and we are nowhere near that goal yet but we're working on it. As always, you can check us out on Facebook. Our page is Role Playing History Podcast. 
On Twitter, hit us up at at Role Playing History Podcast or use the hashtag Role Playing History Podcast. YouTube, we've got a channel, Role Playing History Podcast. Click on the subscribe button and hit the bell to get alerts when we do updates. Or, of course, if you're a little old school, and it's really friggin' funny that I'm calling email old school, but you can email us at roleplayinghistorypodcast at gmail.com. By the way, I always forget to remind you guys that the Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and email stuff should be showing up in the information box for each episode. So if you don't catch it when I say it, you can grab it from there. Or you can listen to the episode again. I mean, you know, hey, the sponsor that I do have pays me by total number of listens. So hint, hint, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, Bob's your uncle. Actually, my uncle is Bob, but we're not getting into that. Okay, so next week we're deep diving Pathfinder. And I got to be honest, I cannot wait to get into that game with you. But that's next week. Until then, I'm Wayne Davis, and you're role-playing history.